Hi guys, welcome to today's show. Today I believe is episode four. Today we're, I'm going to be talking about fly fishing in the Everglades. I'll talk a little bit about um, some spin fishing as well, like light tackle, but this is for the most part specifically about fly fishing. So the Everglades, where is it? <laughs> it's obviously, there's only one of them. It's in Florida and specifically South Florida. So from Lake o Okeechobee south, um, pretty much any water east or west and south of Lake Okeechobee is considered, um, if not part of the Everglades, um, creeks and rivers and canals flow from that area. So uh, technically that's it's Everglades, pretty much south of, of uh, Lake Okeechobee. So, all right, so I fish mostly the western part of the Everglades. The eastern half is more freshwater. The parts closer to Miami um, is freshwater. Uh, the exception to that is Flamingo Everglades National Park, which is at the very southern tip of Florida. But where I fish and where I've guided since 19, well, I've fished there since 1998, guided there since 2003, um, is the western part. So near Everglades City, Naples, that area, the back country of the Everglades. So it's a unique um, fishery in that there's salt and fresh water and brackish water, which is like a combination of the two. And there's, so you get into fish that, uh, you know, you could catch a bass on one, one cast, the next cast could be a tarpon or a snook, a ladyfish, or, you know, invasive species like peacock bass or uh, Mayan cichlids, one of those more invasive type species that uh, didn't evolve in the Everglades. The time of year that I really like to fish out there is the summertime, so the rainy season. There's really just two seasons out there. There's the dry season and the rainy season. In the rainy season, we get a lot of um, afternoon showers, thunderstorms, hurricanes occasionally and with, that dump a lot of water. Um, the dry season, more or less, is from December through April, sometimes into May. Um, Typically, most years we get start getting our, our afternoon showers in May, like mid-May. And then, so that begins the rainy season, the wet season, and wh is, which is actually the time that I prefer to fish out there. And the reason for that is that there's just more water volume. There's more places to fish. In the dry season, the water levels can get really low. So places that are great in the summertime can be bone dry in the wintertime. So hard to fish when there aren't fish there so the um yeah the, the rainy season is my preferred season there's some downsides sides to that of course there's bugs it's hot it's very humid it rains see so pretty much every afternoon so you lose some fishing time uh, waiting for th thunderstorms to pass um, you don't want to get caught out on the water um, in a thunderstorm because you know lightning can be dangerous but um yeah, so anyway, but re regardless of that, I do prefer the summer, the summertime just because there's just more places, more fish around, there's more places to find them, more water to cover, uh, more holding water, and also you, there's flow, so you get flow from the Everglades coming off from rainwater and going south or west, and it it's just almost like trout in a stream, so they... The, um, the predatory fish like snook and tarp in, in particular will line up just like trout and will just face upstream waiting for bait fish and shrimp and you name it, whatever they can eat um, to come towards them. So they just face upstream and then you can, you, so you can, if, if you can find moving water, you can, you can locate these predatory fish. Okay, once you locate these fish, then you got to figure out what they're eating. Um, you don't have to be super particular, specific with your fly selection. As long as it's it's most likely going to be a bait fish pattern. It could be a shrimp pattern, um, but more or less, we're, more or less, we're talking streamer flies or top water things that imitate a bait fish. And the bait fish out there are small, so you're talking you know three quarters of an inch to two inches. Um, the bigger tarpon and snook out there will will occasionally take down you know uh, mullet, big mullet even. Like the black mullet, they can be up to, you know, 12, 14 inches. But for the most part, they're eating mouthfuls of these tiny little gambusia bait fish, these mosquito fish or guppies. Um, and so, so you're using flies that are small. 
um, streamer flies, top water, like I said, um, smaller flies. Well, not small for a trout stream, but small for salt water. So inch long, inch and a half, two inches, somewhere in there. And um, if a fly pushes some water, um, even better because these, these uh, snook and tarpon in particular have strong lateral lines. So they can actually feel the, the bait fish coming towards them, or your fly in this case. So when I tie my flies, I'm using deer hair heads, um, you know, that are wide, that'll push some water, create kind of a wake that they can feel. As even if they don't see it, they can kind of feel it around them or hear it and feel it. Um, so I like flies that push water, subsurface, or topwater flies that get attention, like a, um, guard side gurglers, poppers, even just like a bass popper will work out there if you have a stout hook. Um, so for the flies, it's, it's pretty basic. Just uh, find the fish or a place that looks like it's fishy, and it's, it's more or less blind casting. Uh, there are some giveaways. So tarpon often will come up and, and gulp air. They can breathe air. They can gulp air right into their air bladder. So um, they'll give themselves away. Snook will feed, and they'll bust, and you'll hear pop, and that, that pop is a, a dead giveaway for that a snook is feeding. So... Um, you can kind of target them by sight and sound, but for the majority of the time, it's, it's blind casting. You're just kind of working areas that you think will hold fish. So the tarpon that I prefer, that's my favorite fish to target out there, are small tarpon, juveniles. So we're talking anywhere from, you know, a pound to 10 pounds. Occasionally you'll get 15, 20 pounders. I've hooked them as big as 50, but that's very unusual. The average fish is probably three to five pounds out there, um, tarpon that is. Now snook, you can get into um, very big snook. They're very, they're very difficult to land, however, because uh, the mangroves, you know, have the, the roots that when they go into the water, they have barnacles that collect on them, and they're, the barnacles are sharp. So um, the snook often will just go straight for the mangroves and cut you off. Uh, the bigger snook, the smaller ones you can typically land. But um, tarpon don't do that. If they do that, it's by accident. Um, they're more or less jumpers. You know, they'll, they'll wear themselves out just by jumping. And uh, plus, besides just being really cool to see, and I, I film most of my fishing outings, so to get those jumps on film is just incredible. But um, they, wear, they wear themselves out. So the tarpon, even of the bigger ones, bigger juveniles, are easier to land than the same size snook. Because the same size snook, like a 10-pound snook, is going right for the mangroves. He's going to try to wrap you up and cut you off. That's just where he feels safe. I mean, he doesn't, he can't figure out that he's cutting the line, I'm sure. But they're just going for security cover, trying to escape whatever's, you know, pulling against him. And that this is just hard to land those big snook. I have landed some over 30 inches. But, you know, I've seen plenty over 40. And I've hooked some big ones. But just tough to land. So... They're awesome fish, you know, on a beach, you can hook a snook, a really big snook, and, you know, um, they can run and run and run. As long as you have enough backing, you can eventually wear them out and land them. In the backcountry, they're going right for that thick cover, and, and they're going to more likely break you off. So um, people ask me about rods. So I like a nine-foot rod. A lot of these rods, rod makers are making kind of like these mangrove specials or like backcountry rods, and they're fine. I mean, there's nothing, not a thing wrong with them. They're shorter rods. They're stout. Uh, the butt section's stout, with, and they typically have a soft tip, which is what you want, you know, to turn these flies over quickly so you're not doing all this back cast, casting. But I really don't see it as a necessity. I've just used nine-foot you know, standard nine-foot fly rods out there for years and never had an issue with it. The one exception to that is fishing around bridges. A shorter rod can help, but um, over the years I've gotten away from the bridges along Tamiami Trail and fish, I'm fishing much more in the backcountry from kayak. So a nine-foot rod, you know, is fine in the kayak. You, you don't, you know, it's, it's not an issue at all. Um, and in terms of, of line weight, I'd say anything from a six to an eight weight. Um, I have a seven. I have several seven weights. That's my favorite rod to use out there. I think it's it's the right rod to throw these flies. Plus, it has enough backbone you can land these tarpon and snook. Um, a six weight, you could get get a, would get away with ninety percent of the time using a six weight weight out there because you're not throwing big flies. You know, you match the rod to the fly size, not really to the fish. 
kind of a misunderstanding there, but um, you could even use a five weight out there for a lot of the fishing if you chose to. Uh, the reels, it, as long as it has, I you know, really any reel, um, doesn't even have to be a saltwater reel. You can just, as long as you rinse it out and clean it good after the, your outing, it's a freshwater reel out there is fine. Um, I prefer large arbor reels, but it doesn't, you know, as long as it really, they're just holding line. Most of these fish, you're not, they're not going on long runs. So you're not going to, they're not going to pull you near back, your backing. It's, it's very rare. Um, so just a large arbor is ideal because you can pick up line quicker, but you know, you don't really even need a large arbor reel. You could use a trout reel out there or just a standard, you know, um, trout reel. Large arbor is better, but you don't absolutely need it by any means. Fly lines, I recommend a floating line. Um, and inter there's some applications for an intermediate line. I haven't seen too many times where I would thought a, a sink tip or a full sinking line would have helped me. Any, I, I almost always use a floating line because I fish a lot of topwater flies just to get those you know those strikes up on top because I, I video most of my fishing trips. So seeing those strikes on the surface, you know, just uh, the best. And, um, you know, immediately, especially the tarpon, as soon as you hook them, hook them as soon as they feel the hook, <laughs> sometimes they're hooking themselves. They, they're so aggressive, but they're immediately going airborne. So that's just, you know, and that's what you want, right? You're not, you're not eating these fish. You're just what you're fighting them for the fight and the, the excitement of the hookup and the jumps and the uh, leap, you know, the leaps and these crazy cartwheeling acrobatics they do. Um, so... Yeah, tarpon are my favorite for sure. A snook would be a second, and there's bass out there, like I said. But you know, I can fish bass a mile from where I live, so it's not like uh, I'm going specifically out there to fish for bass. Um, so fly lines. Back to fly lines. Backing, not important as long as you have some backing, of course, just to build up the di diameter of the reel, the spool. But uh, the, I will say this about fly lines: I wouldn't take your best fly line out there. Um, just because they do take a beating, especially if you're going to be fishing from shore a lot. Um, it's really tough on fly line. There's, there's gravel, there's sand, of course, there's just all kinds of stuff that beat up the line that net put little nicks in it. Um, I, these days I'm mostly fishing from a kayak, so I actually do use a pretty good line, um, a more expensive line, but, uh, like a bonefish taper, a shoot, bonefish shooter, I believe it's called. That's an awesome line. It's, it's held up for two years now. It's a seven weight. Um, so I, I really like that line, but if, if you're not going to do this a lot, I would just bring whatever freshwater fly line you have and not an expensive one because it will take a beating. Okay. I spoke briefly about fly selection. Um, you know, I mentioned doll, I don't know if I, I mentioned Garthside gurglers, which is a great, um, top water fly. Um, the thing I like about it over a popper, like a standard popper is they're, they're easier to cast. Although I will say they... They spin a little bit in the air, so sometimes they'll twist your line up, your leader up. But um, I think the uh, advantages outweigh the disadvantages. So I use just all white Guardside Gurgler, um, uh, Dahlberg diver, Divers, white, olive, brown, black. Um, typically in the morning, I'll fish a, a dark fly like a black Dahlberg Diver or a, um, a Guardside Gurgler in black. And then the same thing at dusk, like that last hour, because you know, these fish are looking up and they're looking for a, a silhouette. So the darker the fly in these low light conditions, the better. Middle of the day, I'll use a chartreuse or white fly uh, on a bright day. Um, and then the other classic fly for out there, I think it's um, Mike Connor came up with it. It's the, the Glades Minnow. That's an amazing fly. It's um, It really imitates those little bait fish really well. I mean... Uh, it looks great. I tie a slightly different version of it, but um, he's certainly the originator, and you can't go wrong with Glades Minnow. If I had to have one fly to, to use out there, um, it would be that. I mean, the fact that I film, you don't, it's not as, it's because it's it kind of matches the, the color of the water, more or less, so it doesn't show up well on video. So I like to use white flies or chartreuse just for that reason. But um, if I had to catch, like my life depended on catching a tarpon or a snook on a, on a fly, it would be that, that glades minnow. They're just an excellent pattern for out there. Um, another good fly is a, a small clouser. Um, the, I don't like the heavy 
um, eyed clousers with the lead eyes, but a bead chain, like a sparsely tied gray bead chain clouser is an excellent pattern for out there. Uh, really for anywhere for bass and for anything to eat small bait fish that's just a great pattern and the, with the bead chain eyes they're, they're easier to cast you know because clousers are you know not a pleasure to, to cast especially the heavier ones but you know, got really got to open up your loop and um, uh, another good fly is just a lefties deceiver um, you know an olive back or, or uh, like a peacock curl back white fly even just like an all white one is is good and then any of the EP minnow type flies are really good, especially if you use a, uh, a loop knot because they don't have a lot of inherent um, action on their own. Just the material doesn't move a lot in the water. Um, so if you put a loop knot, it, it, you know, it'll look alive in the water. I, I use loop knots on pretty much all my flies except for poppers and gurglers because um, the, the fact that the loop the fly can get a swing on the loop it actually works against you for trying to get the popper to pop so um it doesn't seem to bother the gurglers too much but the poppers a white popper i just tie it directly with a with a fisherman's knot like an improved clinch knot okay leaders i probably should have started with or skipped flies and gone to leaders after the fly line but leaders i i keep it very simple i tie a um uh, like a 60 40 um, formula so I use six feet of 40 pound mono and then four feet of the rest of the tippet or leader so it could be 40 to 25 25 to 20 or it could just be 40 to 25 and then my fly um, you have to have some kind of bite leader a shock tippet because um, you know, these, like I said, the, these fish have rough mouths. It's like sandpaper, so they will chafe through your fly line if you use, I mean, not through, not through your fly line, through your leader if you're not using um, a, a bite tippet. So even a small snook will wear through your 10 pound like really quickly. So you probably won't even land a small like 10, well, maybe not 10 inch, but 18 inch snook, you'll probably lose it on 10 pound test because it's going to chafe through the leader before you can land it. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to shock tip it. I don't, I don't use commercial, commercially tied leaders. They're just not necessary for out there. I'm kind of down and dirty. Um, if I hook a fish, I want to land it. I don't care about line class records or any of that. I don't need a, a breaking section in there. If I snag it in a, in a mangrove, I just paddle over and pull it out. Or I just, if I'm unsure, I just, you know, straighten the hook, pull it out, break the, the leader if I have to and tie another fly on and keep fishing. Um, I've broken very, very few rods out there. Um, and I think that's typical of fly fishing, you know, ceiling fans and car doors break way more fly rods than fish ever do or ever will. So um, yeah, leaders, not real important. As long as you have something that's gonna turn your fly over. So you have a six foot butt section, heavy line, you know, 50, 40 to 50 pound, and then and then down to 25 or 20. It's it's not a it's not rocket science. It doesn't have to be anything special. Okay, so that's all you ever need to know about fly fishing in the Everglades. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just scratching the surface here. But um, if you want to see more about this specifically in, in the videos, you can go to Mangroves to Mountains channel on YouTube. And if you're interested in any of my flies, they're on in my Etsy shop called Everglades flies um, I tie all kinds of stuff it's not just for the Everglades I tie all, tie steelhead flies and trout flies and panfish poppers and all kinds of stuff but yeah it's uh, Everglades flies on Etsy and then the YouTube channel is mangroves to mountains channel and uh, please check it out I also have a patreon page if you're interested in helping to support the, either the podcast or my YouTube channel that'd be really appreciated much appreciated it's uh, Patreon, and, and just my name, Jim Dusias, D-U-S-S-I-A-S. Okay, talk to you soon, friends. Thank you. Thanks for listening.